Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, we just got a weird message from Barbara. Okay, there she goes. No? All right, there we go. Okay, we got this weird uh, reconnecting. Good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gregory McCormick. I am the manager of uh, cultural and literary programming at Toronto Public Library. This is our very first one page uh, event. We're very happy uh, to see all of you there virtually uh, all across uh, Canada. Um, we start all of our events uh, uh, of course, by acknowledging that all of Canada is on Indigenous land. And since One Page is a Canada-wide network, it's important to be mindful that all of our organizations are situated on this Indigenous land. This land, as we know, was inhabited by hundreds of Indigenous communities who lived, worked, loved, and died on this land long before it was officially discovered. Uh, One Page gratefully acknowledges these Indigenous nations remembered and unremembered for their guardianship of this land. So what is One Page? Uh, we are a network of Canada's libraries and book and literary festivals, and we've all come together uh, to present content for Canadians. Um, but it's also an opportunity to share with all of you the rich literary culture that Canada has in almost every single community. Because of this national network, our viewers on both this channel and on YouTube come from all over Canada, from Halifax and rural Nova Scotia to the Sunshine Coast of Vancouver Island and just about every market in between. Um, our founding organizations include us at the Toronto Public Library, Blue Metropolis Montreal International Literary Festival, Kingston Writers Fest, Ottawa International Writers Festival, Toronto International Festival of Authors, and Vancouver Writers Fest, uh, plus Thin Air Winnipeg International Writers Festival and the Fry Festival in Moncton, New Brunswick. And in addition to those festivals, just about every major library system in the country, including almost every province of Canada, except Nunavut and Northwest Territories, but we're working on those uh, as we speak. Um, this platform might be new to many of you, so just a few hints. I'm in this weird sunlight area. Uh, the chat here is on the right, the chat feed, and that's your chance to engage with other viewers across the country, other viewers, other book lovers, other fans of Barbara, our guest of honor. So start maybe by just telling us where you are uh, today. Um, but if you have a question, uh, please put the questions directly into the box at the bottom of the screen. You'll see that box there that says, ask a question, and you can pop in there at any time and upvote the questions that you like. So this is our first one page event, but we have plenty of other events coming up, including Irish writer Anne Enright next week at the same time. And also other events, including Cheyenne and our Pajo author, Tommy Orange, uh, talking to Wabgishik Rice on Thursday, October 29th. That one is an evening. Uh, and then we also have events with James McBride, the author of Deacon King Kong and Norwegian crime writer, Yo Nesbo. Uh, and those will be posted very soon right here on this Crowdcast channel. And we have lots of other events uh, coming up as well. So if you go to the top of the screen and click on follow, you can be notified when we add events and when an event is about to go live. Um, you can also find out uh, about some of our partner organizations by going to onepagelit.ca, following us on Facebook, Twitter, One Page Lit, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Uh, not all the events are listed yet, so the best way to ensure that you don't miss them is to follow the One Page Lit uh, channel on Crowdcast here, okay? So if you see the green button under the screen, that's where you want to click to buy Barbara's collection of poems. And some of her earlier works include the Poisonwood Bibles, among many others, and you can buy all of those books by clicking there. That's going to take you to the One Page dot, sorry, One Page Lit dot CA collection of bookstores all across Canada. Um, now's your chance to show your love to one of your favorite bookstores. This pandemic's been difficult uh, for independent booksellers and local booksellers. And show your love uh, by buying uh, Barbara's book and clicking on uh, the link, which will take you to a list of all of your local booksellers. And we're adding new booksellers uh, each and every week. And I promise you won't regret this book, even though uh, it, this book wasn't written with the pandemic in mind. I found it so relevant to so many of the things that the world's going through right now. And um, there's just so many beautiful little gem gem poems in here. That uh, This is the kind of book you keep in your bag and you just whip out when you're out at the supermarket waiting in the line or whatever. And and uh, just the, the, the force of them just hit you. It's beautiful, beautiful poetry. Um, and that's enough for me. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our host and our guest of honor. Uh, Parika Bandari is an arts and life reporter in Toronto. She has been published in the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, and the Walrus. 
uh, her CDC Ideas podcast episode on the rise of sectarian violence in India and whether Gandhi's values about nonviolence are still relevant today it just was posted the other day. And um, it's a really amazing exploration of of the, the violence in India, but around the world, uh, and whether uh, these ideas of nonviolence from Gandhi are, 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 are important ideas anymore. Uh, her other ideas, her other areas of interest include uh, intersections of gender and culture and ethnicity, and she is also the producer and co-host of the Hindi language podcast, uh, kababarpodcast.com. And Barbara King Solver, of course, welcome, is the author of nine best selling works of fiction, including the novels Flight, Behavior, The Lacuna, which is one of my favorite books, The Poisonwood Bible, The Bean Trees, uh, and many other works. Uh, her work of narrative nonfiction, which has been highly influential, is Animal, Vegetable, and Miracle A Year of Food Life. Uh, King Solver's work has been translated into more than 20 languages. She has been awarded a number of writing prizes for particular works and for her body of work. Uh, she lives with her family on a farm in Southern Appalachia, and we're very, very happy that she could take the time to be here today. Thank you to you both, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Greg. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Barbara, for being here. And I just wanted to acknowledge that we have people from, as Greg said, across Canada. So Ottawa, Moncton, Toronto, of course, Calgary, London, um, Regina, Saskatchewan, and people also from Nashville, Tennessee, um, New Brunswick, wow. So people really have, Windy Moncton, people have really um, have tuned in from everywhere and I'm, and I'm sure they're excited to, to hear from you. I feel as if I probably don't even need to be here because everybody will have questions to ask, but nevertheless, let me guide this a little bit. Um, so welcome, thank you so much for doing this first of all. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here in Canada without leaving my house. And I want to say I have, I have relatives, I have family in Montreal. So I'm, a, I'm sort of like, Canadian by, you know, sort of by extended family. Indeed. And there are and there are occasions sort of Canadian connections to your to your career, which we can talk about. But um, oh, somebody also says hi from Toronto. We're originally from Appalachia. So there you go. There's those connections. Um, so this is a book of poetry. And it's interesting um, also because today the Nobel um, Prize for Literature was announced and it's a book of American poetry. poetry. Mm -hmm. Louise Glock, so that's exciting. Yeah. So this is exciting very times nice. for and poetry. I'm going to say I'm very excited that two women, for the first time in history, won the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry. So, yes, uh, I was I was excited about that too. I uh, yeah, because science and arts have been uh, a part of your life from the beginning. So yeah. So let's actually talk about poetry because um, many people, I think a lot of people who follow your career would know that you've actually written poetry before. And in fact, um, started out in your university years writing poetry for the, for the you know, periodicals there. So just, could you, could you just talk a little bit about poetry and the role poetry has had in your life and, and then coming to it after uh, almost like it was more than a decade that, that you've written a book of poems? Yes, it has. Well, so, yeah, my last poetry publication, mm -hmm. uh, my last collection of poetry was published in the 90s. So yeah, it has been a while. Um, but uh, and so it might appear that I had just forgotten about poetry and I was, you know, busy writing novels and then just had the idea of writing poetry again. But that's not, of course, how it happened. I've written poetry all along. And poetry has always been really important to me. I think when uh, my earliest memory, one of my earliest memories of sort of literature um, was when I was a little kid, my dad read to us, he sat in this big red chair and we sat on the floor and we listened and uh, some, often he would read us, you know, the adventures of Robinson Crusoe or stuff like that. Um, uh, but I remember him reading the poetry of Robert Burns and choking up. And the, my dad, I mean, I never, ever saw my dad cry. My dad was, you know, a pretty tough guy. But I saw te he, tears running down his face and I, and it was Robert Burns. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what the heck. Wad some gift the gee be gee, yes. You know, like, I didn't know what it meant. Wad some gift the gifty gee us to see ourselves as others see us. Wad some power, excuse me, I messed that up. Anyway, I didn't know what I was hearing. But I saw my dad so moved. I thought, 
this is magic stuff, right? Poetry must be powerful. And I, um, I gravitated toward poetry as er I was an early reader and I would read and I would walk around the house uh, ch chanting, you know, Christina Rossetti, who has seen the wind, neither knew you nor I. And um, me I'm memorizing poetry and, and repeating it to myself because of how I, I loved the sound and the rhythm of the words. So it's always been in there. And I've always in, in any, I've always been a reader of poetry and in anything I write, I try to bear poetics in mind. I once, I always, I pay attention to the rhythm of, and the sound of sentences, even if they're in a novel, even if they're, in, you know, even as a journalist, I tried to pay attention to the rhythm and the sound of the sentences. And it has to do with like placing the, the, a word at the end of the sentence that makes you say, wow. Um, so it's always been there. Uh, I did write, um, I, I had a professor in college, I, I studied biology in, in college because I was very lucky to get to go to college. Most of the people where I grew up didn't, didn't get to do that. So I thought, I, well, I'm here, I better learn something, you know, useful so I can make a living. And so I studied biology and I didn't have a lot of electives, didn't get a chance to take many writing classes. So, I, but I, I went to a, a literature professor and I asked him, this is really pretty much the only literary training I got in my uh, college years was this one conversation I had with a, a professor, a literature professor. And I said, how could I be a better writer, Dr. You know, Dr. Uh, whatever your name is? And he said, write sonnets. It will teach you discipline. So I, I wrote like a hundred sonnets and uh, that, because that's the kind of hairpin I was. I thought, well, he says this this will help. And um, 99 of them were stupid. Uh, one was good. I still think is good. But he was right. I mean, writing 14 line sonnets that had that structure, that had that rhythm taught me something. And um, so it's all so it's all been in there, you know, all along. But I discovered in around the time that I, I started pondering the possibility, uh, taking the risk of walking away from a paycheck and trying to be a freelance writer, uh, and then actually getting a novel uh, written and published, I, did, I made this amazing discovery that people will pay you for writing novels. Uh, nobody much pays you to write poems. So, um, so writing novels became my day job. And poetry was just always the thing I did because I can't help it because I love it. And, um, and I, so I've been writing them all along. Uh, why this collection now is sort of an easier answer. I have in the last four or five years when it just felt to me like the world was going to hell in a handbasket, I turned to certain kinds of reading for comfort and poetry is one of them. Poetry has that amazing capacity to like wake up the like the the neurons of wonderfulness in your brain you know just like to give you feelings of happiness but also kind of quiet you down at the same time so i've been doing a lot of that reading a lot of poetry of sort of a calming and quieting type which doesn't mean that it's not uh, you know, important. It just means that it's, 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 you know, it has that soothing quality to it. And then that's what sort of started coming out of me as well. And so I accumulated, a, you know, a sort of significant amount of poetry and went to my editor last summer, uh, thinking nobody wants to publish a, you know, a collection of poetry, but they said, yes, I was very happy. She said, yes, this might be just the thing to bring out in you know in the fall of 2020 <laughs> little did we know what that was, what, what that was going to mean but it has been and it has because it was written in a time sort of in a time frame in a frame of mind of i would like to create a relief package to send into a troubled world um that's kind of what it is and that doesn't mean it's a lullaby or anything i mean it's not going to put you to sleep I mean, it's going to ask some troubling questions, but also give you some 
some comfort too. I hope that's my hope. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, a, a lot of uh, people have called you prescient. I mean, you seem to somehow tap into this this thing that we're all going to be talking about with with your you know even your your books um whether it was unsheltered <laughs> sort of looking you didn't quite know what it was you were writing i mean writing to at the time of of writing and even with these collection of poems do you do you get that feeling sometimes of, of observing something that that's going to happen in the coming future well i do i mean i've even had weird experiences of writing a writing something it, writing something about something that's that could happen in the future and then watching it happen and i'll i'll give you an example when i was writing the poisonwood bible um there's this part of it that sort of projects across several decades and i imagined the death of mobutu the the dictator mobutu who's responsible for you know genocide and he's a horrible horrible person and i imagined his death and I wrote a scene in which Mobutu died, and it's a very visible graphic scene. Um, and then a month or two later, Mobutu died. And I read the um, the description, you know, what there was, the description of, of how he how and where he died. And I went back and I looked at my scene and I didn't have to change anything. So I thought, hmm, who's next? <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I have noticed that, um, you know, like Animal Vegetable Miracle, um, our, our book about the, you know, about the industrial food system and local food, we wrote that at a time when nobody was talking about it or interested at all. I had no uh, belief that my publisher would embrace it. We brought it to them. They said, okay, we'll publish this. And then boom, I mean, that whole movement really exploded. Um, nationwide and you know continent wide not because of us just because the time was right so um yeah i do feel i've had that kind of luck a lot of times and part of it i think is that even though i was trained i was a good southern girl and i was trained to keep my mouth shut uh i don't when i see something i'm kind of one of the first people to say excuse me, not okay, you know, just sort of like blurt out, this is not okay. And this has been, um, this has come back to bite me more than a few times. For example, after uh, the September 11th attacks um, in, in this, on this country in 2001, I wrote a series of op-ed pieces saying, okay, my fellow Americans, this is a moment for us to think about who we are, to think about, kindness and 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 sort of showing the world the face that we can you know the best that we can be instead of an eye for an eye and you know sort of revenge and being becoming you know answering fundamentalism with fundamentalism you know i wrote these these uh pieces about sort of like you know stepping up to our best level not when anybody wanted to hear at the time when I became vilified nationally for being, you know, a bad, uh, you know, a, a, a bad patriot or an unpatriotic person and a, you know, an horrible person. So I learned that op-ed pieces are not the way to go because that's kind of an overnight news cycle. It, it doesn't give people time to process. Maybe I just process things quickly or something. Um, my family would tell you that I'm a very impatient person. I'm, I'm like, I'm the person who's like, okay, I, I know this part of the story, let's get to the end. So um, I have learned that there's a time when people are ready to hear something and it's not tomorrow, it might be like next year, which works out well for publishing books. <laughs> and we'll come to the politics of some of your books um, and the poetics of it. But coming back to the poetry, we had um, a question in, in the in the question area, and and this is a question that I had as well about your first uh, series of the how to uh, series. Your your in your collection, you have um, the how to poems, uh -huh. the how to poems, and then you have the I, I always mispronounce. Um, uh, Pele, I always get that Pele, wrong. Pellegrinaggio. Pellegrinaggio. I'm sure there are nine million Hindi words I could not. 
um, and then a whole bunch of other other poems as well, uh, which are equally delightful. But but just how to because they seem so perfect for this particular point of time. Could I actually get you to perhaps read how to survive this because it seems something that we all are are talking about, and then you could sort of talk about how you came about these how to poems. Okay, yeah, it's funny because how to how to survive this is one of the older poems in the collection. I wrote this actually a number of years ago, um, uh, thinking about how you know you know how it is when you you go to bed and you can't fall asleep because you're turning over and over and over that thing you said to somebody that was stupid or they you know like that thing that happened that you just wish you could fix and you just fixate it and maybe maybe you know maybe you don't know what i'm talking about but no i do i have spent so much of my life worrying about stuff and thinking this is just the end of the world that i did that um with without pausing to think you know in like five to ten days I'm, I probably won't even remember this. And the person I pr purportedly offended probably already forgot about it. How we just, how we sort of fixate on the here and now and we catastrophize without realizing that, you know, a lot worse stuff is going to happen <laughs> and we should really kind of save our chops for, you know, for what's next. So I was kind of thinking about that. Um, and some, somehow, because when this collection was po was, of poems was published, it kind of leaped out on a on a, 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 a on a global uh, in, in the global view as the sort of the um, uh, a, a, kind of an anthem for the pandemic. So um, it's how to survive this. Oh misery! Imperfect universe of days stretched out ahead. The string of pearls and drops of venom on the web. Losses of heart, of life and limb. News of the worst. Remind me again. The day will come when I look back amazed at the waste of sorry salt when I had no more than this to cry about. Now I lay me down. I'm not there yet. That is beautiful. Um, one of my favorites, actually, as I told you before, was the one that's on the flip side of this, how to give thanks for a broken leg. And I wonder if you could read that as well. Uh, of course I can. Yeah, the how, there, are, there are 14 or 15 how-to poems that open uh, this collection. And so, you know, they're all very practical things like um, how, to, how to shear a sheep, how to, how to have a child, uh, of course, how to fly. Um, this is going to, you know, really help you a lot in your life. And this is how to give thanks for a broken leg, uh, because um, I'm going to tell you I'm speaking as an expert. I have broken each of my legs twice. So at this point, I guess you'd call it a hobby. Um, uh, and so I've, I've figured out, you know, how to um, how to do this. <clears throat> how to give thanks for a broken leg. Thank your stars that at least your bones know how to knit. Two sticks at work, tibia, fibula, ribbed scarf as long as a winter. The mindless tasks a body learns when it must. Praise your clawfoot tub. Tie a sheet around its belly like a saddle on a pig to hammock your dry docked limb while the rest of you steeps. Sunk deep in hot water up to your chin. Dream of the troubles you had when trouble was still yours to make. The doctor says eight weeks. Spend seven here. Be glad for your cast that draws children with permanent markers like vandals and their graffiti to the blighted parts of town. They mark out their loves and territories and you, the benevolent mayor, will wear these concerns in public, then throw them away when your term is up. Concede your debt to life's grammar, even as it nailed you in one fell stroke from subject to object. Praise the helping verbs, family hands that feed, the surgical modifiers that pin you from shattered 
to fixed, to mended. Praise the careless syntax of a life where, through steady misuse, a noun grows feet. It turtles and out foxes, and one day, with no one watching, steps out as a brand new verb. It's beautiful. I, I especially yeah. love that second paragraph because um, there's so much happening in there, both in terms of not just the information, but just the craft of it. And this was another question that has come up as a, a to the craft or structure. Like you've talked in the past uh, about your novels and how you architecture them and, mm -hmm. and then the characters come, but then always the poetry of the language is so important to you. And I wonder what happens when it comes to poetry. How do you write poetry? How do you craft it or structure it? Well, it's, it's kind of a shortcut to the part that I love the best because with a novel, I mean, I, I, you know, I like it all. I'm very lucky. I feel like I have the, you know, the best job in the world sitting right here in this spot uh, talking to my imaginary friends all day long um, is wonderful. It's great fun. But um, what I like the best, you know, I do with a novel, I do kind of years of work of kind of cooking it on the back burner, figuring out what this what this big book will be about, what the plot will be, what the characters will be, you know, sort of doing all of the kind of ground work. It's like building, you know, it's just, it is, it's like putting up the beams of a bridge or something. And then it's such a happy day when I get all that done and I can just get down to the sentences. That's like painting, you know, painting flowers on the bridge or whatever you want to paint on the, on the bridge. It's like the fun stuff. So with poetry, skip the, skip the steel, you know, and the eye beams get straight to the language because I love language so much. It makes me so happy to think about the difference between broken to fixed, to, to pinned to fixed, to mended, you know, which of those is stronger and to, um, to, to link lines with internal rhymes and just to, you know, just to play with words and get, get them, get them to dance, you know, in, to introduce the most fun thing in, in poetry is to introduce two ideas that were previously unacquainted it's like you're setting them up on a blind date and then you meet them and they go kapow you know nobody ever thought that these two things could be the same uh and so that's the part that kind of lights up lights up your brain but then also investing it with some kind of some kind of gravitas you know because it's not just all fun and games it, there has to be some there's there's a thread of meaning in there, and there's off, often kind of a playful, um, a, pl a kind of a, a a fan dance or whatever you know a a little bit of a thematic striptease because you think the poem's about something, and then you you, you know you playfully peel off layers, and then in the usually in the last line or it's often a couplet the last two lines. See, this was my that professor of sonnetry talking to me. Often the last two lines strip off the last veil and there's some naked truth. And you go, oh, oh, that's what you were saying. So I think that's the um, that's the part of it that kind of settles your heart, kind of bringing you around in your own mind to these these truths that you really know that you needed to be reminded about. And one of the things, even though it's kind of a, you know, it's a silly, it's a silly, it's a silly funny poem, how to be, how to be thankful when you have a broken leg. But a lot of these poems are about gratitude, about the possibility that what you need the most, what you think you need the most, you might already have. And that's why I'm so happy to be releasing this book into a pandemic, because I think that's so so much of what we've all been doing. Uh, at the same time that we're kind of whining about, I can't go here and I can't go there and stuff, but we're also stripping our lives down to what we really need. Now, of course, this is not to minimize the terrible losses. I've lost people too. The loved ones we've lost, the jobs we've lost, the, the this financial and emotional security we've lost, the help we've lost from, you know, from extended family. We've lost a lot, but we're also learning at the same time what we have 
and what we can do with it. Like, so it, it's the, I would say the theme of the, the I mean, my six word uh, summary of this pandemic is learning to make more from less. Um, and you know what? A lot of us needed to do that anyway. Um, cause, uh, cause that's kind of the, the failure of that has gotten us in big trouble as a, as is, I would say as a country, as a continent, as a, you know, as, as a sort of on a global scale, a lot of us already have plenty and just want more, more, more. And so at a, you know, speaking at the cultural level, um, learning to learning that less is enough um could could be uh could be good for us i just wanted uh people tuned in uh just remind remind them that they can ask a question i've been reading them in the in the middle that last one was by jordan river so thank you so much for that question um and i'll keep on trying putting in these questions in the middle um but you know so you you mentioned these um losses i mean and and one of the uh, I think one of the things that people are also struggling with during this pandemic, I mean, while they are being thankful, but I think there are also moments of trials that that people have. And you have another poem in here, How to Get a Divorce. Um, and, I, and I wonder if you could talk about that. And um, because on, on some levels, you know, people are also dealing with difficult things with that they do have. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, can yeah. you, can we talk sometimes about that? What you, what, to, yeah, to turn it around, sometimes what's right in front of you is the thing you do not want anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I, I'll tell you, I'm so grateful to have a very entertaining spouse. Um, um and and i'm lucky you know we had we we uh we had quite a few years to work that out um uh, before before this time but for so many people i know particularly you know people whose lives were held together perhaps by by their children who are who that are you know now moved out and they can't visit or their grandchildren they can't visit or even you know other friends or travel or other activities that are not there for you know, kind of the happy noise of our lives that was masking something very wrong at home, uh, that's all gone. And so again, you know, this is a moment of reckoning for all of this when we are asking what we really, what's, what is, you know, what's the difference between want and need? What do we really need? And um, sometimes that's turning into not being married. So this is um, perhaps, yes, also a pandemic poem. And, um, and this is, I also know this from experience. I married very, very young, uh, made, made a big mistake. And, you know, and uh, so, so uh, I, I know how to get over it. So this is how to get a divorce. Fight for these things. One phone call to your mother in law. The credit you deserve because sacrifice for love is a cozy hearth or a spark that burns down the house. It's all in the timing. The flimsy relics of childhood, yours. The car you could talk to. The tools you learned to live by. Your children intact, blessed by your diplomacy. A language of words you will chisel out of ice. No work you've ever done will cost you more or purchase more. Don't fight for these, the car that's not paid for, every gift you pretended to like. Take one object treasured by your spouse, something small that won't be missed, smash it with a rock. Bury the remains in the backyard, bear the pall however, it's your party. By the powers vested in hearsay, your marriage is now oil and water. Some of your friends will choose to drink the oil. These you have to give up. Collected shells and pressed flowers. The eyes that knew your body when it was still perfect. Everything must go. Don't throw it in the Grand Canyon. Seal it all in a box with packing tape, shoved to the, to the back of a closet. Years from now, when some passion brings new order to your household, 
you will open this box, find inside music you've since gone looking for, wedding photos, two sweet kids with comical hair, a ring for your daughter, prop for the story she's had to rewrite alone, your one-time self in a rummage of lost and found. Quietly set it all out on a shelf in plain sight, because like rain and gravity, these things are right and flattening and dearly necessary. And in as much as they're anyone's, they're yours. That's beautiful. Um, I wanted to ask you since I since I have you on this right now, um, and it's something that I've been grappling with as well. So um, there's this, you know, you this this you've said, and I think in the past you've talked about your your mother's um, marriage and and you know the role that she um, played, and and you saw her. Uh, play as you were growing up and how that influenced you to seek a certain type of life and but then when you the wrote your the life. opposite Honestly. yes uh, <laughs> the opposite um, and then when you wrote um, animal vegetable miracle you also sort of talked about um, in one interview I was listening to about how you know sometimes we have forgotten uh, the benefits of the kitchen or, or something to the, the the power of being able to cook and and how it's a beautiful thing. So where do we find the balance in not quite wanting to be in the kitchen, but at the same time, this 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 hearth being a place of sustenance or, or love or whatever it is? Yeah, it, it is. It has been an interesting journey, particularly for women of my age. Um, and it's uh, um, because I, I grew up in a household uh, with a mother who was a housewife, who was really had no choice in her time. You know, the 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 1950s and early 1960s gave gave adult women in the United States no no uh, respectable choice but to go back home, leave the jobs that some of them had during World War II, um, so that you know, returning men uh, from war could take all those jobs. And there was this huge propaganda campaign to convince all these smart women that your your best, you know, you're going to be happiest uh, if you stay home with your vacuum cleaner and your children. And they did all this stuff to try to make it sound like fulfilling. Um, you know, like they advertised dishwashing soap as like atomic or something. You know, like it had like chemical powers and only you the, the household chemist knows how to use di this dishwashing soap but you know they just like, tried to they just put this whole song and dance on on the women of my mother's age that you you can't you're not allowed to do anything else you can't do anything else so shut up and be happy my mother wasn't you know I, she i she clearly was cut out for something other than you know us kids and picking up our socks because she made a plane she hated that and I grew up with a very clear idea that I was going to get out of there, learn a trade, support myself. Um, and, and so I, I just pretty much re refused um, any lesson about, you know, how to do laundry. I was, um, you know, I was that second wave feminist who said, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to live a life of servitude, you know, to, to husband and children. I'm going to have my own life. A whole lot of us grew up. And then, you know, pretty early on in my, in my uh, adulthood, I figured out I also would like to be a mother, but I'd like to be a mother with a job. And, you know, oh, I mean, there's plenty of mothers who all along, even through the 50s and 60s, had a job, you know, had to because that that idyllic, you know, husband who brought home the bacon was not was not a possibility for them. Um, so I connected with the notion that I wanted my uh, my I wanted to create a life of 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 service to the world instead of to a family, but then learned um, that I also very, very much enjoyed having a family. And I think my I, I think my kids would agree with this. I was I, I became a better writer because I have children, uh, because I know what most of the women in the world are dealing with. I mean, you know, I have the sympathy 
uh, and empathy and, and from experience of sort of what it's like to be a mother. And I, it's like, you know, I know much more about how to write, you know, ch children as characters because I watch them every day and, and know what they're like at every age, you know, from birth to, you know, to, to now, to mid thirty or to, you know, twenties and thirties. Um, so I think that writing enriched my writing in terms of characters and theme and, and all that uh, and gr sort of gravity. I also think my children would agree that I was a better mother because I had a job. Um, because I had something else that was fulfilling to me, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting them to live my life for me. I wasn't breathing down their necks and saying, you have to, you know, you have to excel, you know, don't, I didn't send them out the, the door every day saying, don't disgrace the family. You know, I just like, I could, I could be chill and let them have their lives because I had mine and sort of it helped to establish boundaries. And I also gave them the model of not an unhappy mother, but a very happy mother who does important work in the world. And because I have two daughters, I think that was one of the best things I could give them because now they're both young adults and they're doing important work in the world. And one of them has already also become a mother and she's very good at it. So, um, so, I'm glad that I took that route, but your your question, of course, I haven't forgotten, was about food. So I, like a lot of women of my generation had to come back around from, okay, we're not slaving over hot stove. Here's the Lunchables, you know, here's like all the convenience foods and didn't realize that we were being, you know, we were being hoodwinked by the industrial food system that just gave us bill of goods. We'll do all that for you, honey, don't worry. And we will basically trash the health of your family by giving you cheap, really bad food that's made of junk, made out of junk. And we just kind of accepted that bill of goods as necessary if we, you know, sort of because we didn't have the time to be, you know, to, to, to be the, the kitchen slaves. So it, it's kind of a reckoning for a lot of us to come back around to, I threw the baby out with the bathwater. Cooking is, is the best way to be sure that you are eating well, that your family's eating well, and that you have some control over, you know, over your health and what's going into your mouth. And it doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be, you know, the full Indian dinner, as we all, <laughs> as we've all heard, um, the, you know, the all day, uh, the all day affair. But there, there, there are some basic skills we need to be for to guarantee the health and safety of our family. So recovering those is step one. Recovering a family culture of food is what I think we wrote about a lot in, in Animal Vegetable Miracle as sort of adjusting our, our thinking about cooking as not, not thankless service, but something a family can do together, something that bonds us. I mean, breaking bread, sitting down together over a meal is the most fundamental communion of, you know, of all human history and humankind and to recover that like politically, sociologically, is, is a project. And it's something we talk a lot about in that book. And I would say it's been, and it helps that I, I married um, an Italian and his mother, uh, I married his mother at the same time, who's a very important person in my life. And Italian food culture is so rich and valuable. You know, she, she sat me down, you know, before I married her son and told me, you know, the things that, that, he likes to eat. And I told her, and you know, you need to talk to him about this too, because he's going to help me cook. So, you know, and we, and that was, you know, that, which was fine with her, but, you know, sort of reconstructing a food culture that doesn't feel oppressive, that feels like fun, that feels like family bonding um, is, is the project. And I, I, if I had all the time in the world, we'd talk about your mother-in-law because she also figures largely in this in this collection. But I want to get to some um, some audience questions um, because we're at that sort of fifteen minute spark where this is about to end. I'm often so this is by Kelly Grant 
Kelly Grantland. I'm often interested in writers with an international following and how they respond to other kinds of readers in other languages. What has surprised you about the reception of your work in other languages? Are audiences different? Um, I'm sure there are, and I, you know, I don't really know. I mean, <laughs> when when I when I agree to a translation, you know, and sign a contract for you know a book of mine to be translated in Polish or Korean or what or Finnish or what have you, this is an exercise in letting go for me because I have no idea. I I, I seldom have any interaction with those translators and when i get the book when it arrives at my you know when it's a translated completed book and um you know it arrives at my doorstep i pull it out of the box and say i don't even know sometimes i don't even know what language it is i don't know what book it is sometimes i don't know whether i read it from back you know like from the back to the front some i do i mean the, the my and i will say my my spanish translator and, and my french my French tra translator is actually a very good friend and we have worked together on many, many books and I can read those translations and give some, you know, and we were, you know, and give input as we go along. Likewise, the, the Spanish, a lot of them, I will never know it. Um, there, are, there are a few things I can say about that. One is it has always astounded me that people in Korea or Japan or Estonia or, or, or you know, or, or Israel want to read my books. I feel like, why? You know, I think that I write very American books. It's sort of who I am. It's my milieu. It's sort of my, my, my job, I think, is to, to analyze, uh, analyze and, and, uh, and express and, and, and question and, and discuss my culture. So um, why they want to know about it? Well, somebody told me, Barbara, everybody in the world wants to know about Americans um, for the, kind of the same reason they watch a lot of our stupidest movies. Uh, they just want to know what makes us tick. And I guess that's what I want to know too, what makes us tick. So I appreciate the interest. I um, don't get a lot of fan mail from you know finland or uh i mean maybe now that i'm on instagram maybe i'll start getting more you know like uh instagram followers from you know other countries it's it's i have started getting a few like tag you know uh getting tagged and i look at the post and think huh wonder what that's about <laughs> but um you know you hope for the best um i am i am grateful deeply grateful myself for translated literature when it's translated beautifully it is you know a work of art and it also uh allows me uh, you know to broaden this this whole project of empathy which reading literature is about anyway it's a it's a it's a project of putting down our own lives when we pick up a book and entering the life of another and seeing life through another person's eyes that makes us better people. It's what's going to save us. It's it's what's you know empathy is is the missing ingredient right now that's causing most of our problems. Empathy between humans and empathy, a failure of empathy between humans and a failure of empathy between humans and all other species that we just you know don't seem to care that we're we're um, we're we're killing uh, wholesale. So so yeah, I'm grateful for translation. And I just hope it's good. <laughs> um, so this is a question by Courtney um, and dittoed by Myra Schuster. Do you have any writing rituals slash routines that set you up for a productive writing day? Um, I, I, my career as a ri professional writer has been almost precisely um, um, uh, that happened exactly at the same time as my career as a mother. I wrote my, I mean, I was working as a freelance journalist and I was doing some writing um, uh, beforehand, but while I wrote my first novel while I was pregnant with my first child, brought her home, learned the day I came home with my first baby uh, that I had a, a publishing contract for my first novel. So I became a mom and a novelist on the same day. So for the most of my career, I only could write 
when my children were in someone else's care, exactly the way, you know, a mother who's a bank teller or, you know, a, a bus driver or any other job uh, has to work. Uh, I, only, I, have, I have to confess to you that I had this idea, you know, that I just put the baby in the basket right down here at the foot and I would just write and <laughs> yeah, I learned real fast about that. Um, so no, um, I have always written I, I could only write in those constrained hours when my children were being cared for by someone else, which I had to pay for if it wasn't public school. So my muse, I always said, is the school bus. When they go, I, I go. And probably because of that, because in my earliest years, well, you know, earliest decades, frankly, uh, as a writer, my writing time was constrained. I had to, I had all, you know, I would be thinking of, you know, I'd be getting ideas. I would have whole paragraphs, dialogue flooding into my brain. And I had to hold it until I dropped them off. And then I would just, so I was like so eager to get to my desk. I was like a racehorse at the gate. Can you picture that? Just like, <laughs> just boom, ready to go. So I think because I, I was trained that way as a writer, I'm still like that. I don't need... I, I sit down, I go. Uh, I think being a working mother trains you, just generally speaking, in being highly efficient. You get to tasks and you get them done. And so I've read um, about other writers, um, you know, who have very different lives, who have to, you know, like pick fleas out of the cat for an hour or I don't know what, you know, to, no, no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um... Uh, so this is by Susan Hughes. Is it always clear to you when you sit down to write whether you'll be writing poetry or prose? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about the moment I turn on my computer, you know, I generally think, what am I going to work on today? Is it going to be the novel? If, if I'm in the middle of a novel, it's going to be the novel. I don't uh, but if I come to my desk with a poem in my mind, it's going to be a poem. Um, I, uh, what's the best way to put that? I, I, as a writer, I start with theme. I start by knowing what I'm going to write about. Um, and I don't mean like what happens. Um, you know, a guy goes for a walk, gets, you know, gets hit by a bus, whatever. What a depressing story. Anyway, you know, I'm not talking about plot. I'm talking about theme. Like, is this, this is about, oh, just to choose some examples from like the, the, the theme of flight behavior was, um, why is it so hard for us to talk about climate change? Why is it that many people can look at one thing and come away believing they've seen different things. How do we make up our minds what we believe? That was sort of the thematic material of flight behavior. So that's what I knew I was going to write about. And I knew that had to be a novel because that's big stuff. It is, um, it is, it's, it requires the vehicle of a novel, the capacious vehicle of a novel, a lot of characters, a lot of plot. Um, I know I know a poem, you know, is going to be a poem when it its theme kind of comes to me all at once, uh, and it seems like something that can be finished concisely. Um, like I went for a walk in the woods, saw these beautiful little flowers that have an interesting evolutionary history, which I know because I'm a biologist that, that involved them quitting on chlorophyll. I mean, they were green plants and then they just decided in the way that a plant decides, because they do, to walk away from chlorophyll, which is a paycheck. You know, that's a that's such a such an easy gig. You know, hold up your hands, get sugar. You know, it's always there. So these plants, this species of plant walked away from that to take a chance on another kind of life, more like a freelance life. And when I took that walk and I was admiring those plants, those little plants are called ghost pipes. I was thinking about how that's gutsy. And then I thought, I've done that too. I get it. That's a poem. Like, as I was saying before, two things that you would never think would be alike, the life of Barbara King Silver and the life of the, you know, this he Heather uh, that gave chlorophyll 
pop them together, that's going to be a poem. It's not going to be a novel. It's not even going to be a short, it could be a short story, but it feels to me like a poem. Um, I always use the, um, the um, because I write in many different genre and people ask me how I do that. I just, my answer is I consider that I have this garage with all the different, with all these different vehicles. A novel is like a station wagon. You know, you can stuff so much in there and more people come on along, you get in too, and you can go a long way. Um, I've been saying that um, a poem is like a bicycle. You can carry one thing, it's sleek, it's quiet, it's quick. You have to pay attention to balance. And then I recently chatted with a poet who said, it's really kind of more like a unicycle. And I said, you are so right. You can carry one thing and you really have to pay attention. And this is not about traveling anywhere. This is about the, the sort of the, um, the performance. And so that's how, you know, that's how I know. I know once I know what it's about and know what it's going to be, it's going to be a poem. Once in a while, I'll wrote, write a poem. If, okay, if I'm writing a novel and it's sort of, I'm really in the middle of the novel, it's going, it's just flowing, then pretty much everything I think of is going to go into the novel. So there are probably many things I, that could have been poems, but they just get absorbed into the novel because that's where I am in the poetic language. It might be just a paragraph of the novel, but it fits. So my, I, I promise you that my novels have cannibalized thousands of poems. Sorry, you can, you know, you can, you know, you can set them up and, you know, shoot them if you want, but uh, that's what happened to a lot of poems. But when I'm in between novels, then I'm sort of more free for these poems to just be poems. Can I just, I mean, I know this is going to be a pretty big question to throw you at the last, uh, as the last thing, um, but you know, for you, you've, you've talked about how writing is political. Um, and just given where we are at the moment where people don't seem to believe the news so much. Um, and and there, you, as you mentioned, you know, literature gives you empathy. I'm wondering if you're you're seeing your role as somebody who's able to kind of bridge these divides that we seem to be finding ourselves in. Um, I hope so. I think artists. I mean, I, in the in the best way po possible, we can look to our artists as sort of bellwethers of of social social change and as a, for guidance of how to be as people. And so that's, and that's a tall order. And I do think about it and take it seriously as an artist myself. Um, I said earlier that I, that I think art, the, the project of literature fundamentally is empathy. And that's, for that reason, I think all good art is political because it is creating compassion for the theoretical stranger. It is the opposite of meanness and war. It's the antidote really to meanness and war, creating an understanding of other, of other lives, other cultures, other genders, other tribes. And boy, do we need that now more than ever in my country. And part of why I feel that poetry is an important relief package in this moment is that we have gotten to a point where half of us don't believe a word the other half is saying and are not even it, and it's, it's beyond that we're not even listening to each other we've all got our own news feeds and we're listening to the news that we already believed and it's already telling us what we want to hear and they're doing the same and we're not even talking to each other so what can i do what can i offer to this world that won't listen to each other poetry poetry is so fundamental Poetry can speak to those, those things we all believe in, no matter who we are politically. We all believe, we all feel grief and joy the same way. So poetry can give us, give us that coming together, that communion as people. I love that idea to end uh, this. As someone who spent my almost my whole career promoting art and artists and writers and painters, I think that, uh, that that's exactly right. And that's why we need artists. And that's why we need art for those uh, precise reasons. I couldn't have said it better. So thank you for that. And thank you for this really, really wonderful conversation. I feel like it could have gone on for another two hours. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, and it doesn't always work that way. So, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Barbara, um, for your, your your thoughtful answers. Uh, that was wonderful. Yes, and just a quick reminder, the link at the bottom is gonna take you to a one page lit.ca where you can buy Barbara's book from booksellers across Canada. And if you're in America, I'm sure you can easily find a local bookseller there to buy the book or in any other country for that matter. Um, thank you so much, Aparita, for that wonderful conversation. Uh, Barbara made it easy though, I have to say, like uh, she, she she has a lot, to, a lot of thoughts and I think it was fascinating to hear uh, to hear all that had all came together. Uh, Barbara, thank you so much. I know uh, I know you're very selective about the events that you do, and we're very honored that you chose to do uh, your first your event with us. Uh, One page is our first event. Um, it was a wonderful it was a wonderful event. And thank you everyone for watching. Uh, and we'll see you again next time next week and in right. Bye everyone. Bye Canada. Thank you. Bye Barbara. <laughs>